So, this is week four, session four, in a four session cycle. So this evening, we're gonna have a conversation about steps 10, 11, and 12. Uh, essentially, we're gonna find out about the maintenance and growth of our spiritual condition once we've recovered from a hopeless state of mind and body. So what we know at this point, what we ought to know, is we know what we did to prepare for the program of action. We know what we did to prepare for the work. Uh, we did the first three steps. So we found out in the first step what our problem is, or at least what the problem with an alcoholic is, and then we had an opportunity to diagnose ourselves. I.e. asked the question, is this wrong with me? Is this my problem, alcoholism? We found out that an alcoholic is someone who has a physical allergy to alcohol, which means once they take a drink, they have no ability to determine how many more drinks they're gonna have after that first one, and that that physical allergy is compounded by a mental obsession, which means that once they stop drinking, much as they may not wanna go back to it, uh, they will become quickly or slowly restless, irritable, and discontent, uh, which essentially means they'll have trouble living inside their own skin comfortably, and that will eventually get painful enough that they'll turn to the only thing they know of that will quell the pain, which is a drink, and so trigger the physical allergy again. Right? So we found out what's wrong with us. In the second step, we found out what the solution is to what's wrong with us. Right? Power greater than human power, God. We talked about the idea that all you need to do is be willing to believe that there might be some power in this universe greater than you to do the second step successfully. So one and two were information gathering steps only. In the third step, we made an affirmative declaration based on our understanding of the problem and the solution to the problem that we were ready to do whatever it took to bring the solution to light. Then in the second session, we got down to work. We talked about doing a fourth step, a searching and fearless moral inventory. We talked about the fact that the main building blocks of that inventory are our resentments, our fears, and the ways in which we've hurt others, harms done others. Uh, we talked about format. We talked about the idea that the key to that fourth step is being entirely honest and not withholding any information. And then in the fifth step, we talked about sitting down with another human being, and then of course with our higher power and with ourselves, and giving all that information up, right? Illuminating every twist of character, every dark cranny of the past. Then once that information had been cast out in the third session, in the sixth step, we talked about becoming willing to have all these defects of character taken from us. And that once we were willing to do that, in the seventh step, we added a prayer into our lives, actually asking God to remove from us all these defects of character, all the things in us which we admitted are objectionable. Right? And then that brought us to the end of the taking care of ourselves part of the steps, cleansing ourselves part of the steps. And we moved into dealing with others, into dealing with our fellows. I told you that I have a good friend who always summed up the steps thusly. One, two, and three got me right with God. Four, five, six, and seven got me right with me. Eight, nine got me right with you. And 10, 11, and 12 keep me right with God, with me, and with you. So in eight, nine, now that we had dealt with the cleansing of ourselves, in the eighth step, we talked about making a comprehensive list of those people we had hurt and becoming willing to make amends to all those people. And then in the ninth step, we talked about the process of beginning making proper amends, and what it looks like to make a proper amend. And that brings us to 10, 11, and 12. This is the point at which we're going to become spiritually awake, spiritual awakening. And in 10, 11, and 12, we're gonna find out how to maintenance and grow what we've been given, i.e. recovery. You know, I would offer to you in terms of understanding the alcoholic or the addict, uh, the metaphor of a computer that's got a virus, right? And if you came across a computer that had a virus and didn't really know anything about the computer, you might take a look at that computer and think, oh, defective computer, right? When in fact, it's probably not a defective computer. Probably that computer came off the factory line with all its proper parts and all the things it needs to function properly, right? But at some point, it came in contact with some faulty information that has rendered it unable to function the way it's supposed to function. It may even have crippled it 
in terms of functioning the way it's supposed to function. And let's face it, an alcoholic, an addict, same thing, right? You might well look at an addict or an alcoholic and think to yourself, defective person. The alcoholic or addict certainly will give off the vibe of a defective person, right? But this is not a defective person. Most probably, that person came off the you know, factory line, as it were, with all its proper parts and what it needs to function properly in the world. But they came across some faulty information, which has rendered them unable to function properly, may even have crippled them in their ability to function properly. We know that about human beings. We know that about al alcoholics and addicts because we know that mankind's most basic natural instinct is survival. You know, that's why you'll hear stories about someone who's like skiing and falls and gets their leg caught in a bear trap and crawls like 37 miles to safety or a grandmother who, you know, like pulls a car off her grandkid. Or... There's nothing we are wired for more than survival, right? But the alcoholic or addict is actually wired for self-destruction, right? We're operating 180 degrees apart from mankind's most basic instinct and in that we're actively trying to kill ourselves. Right? So some information's gotten into the CPU that is disallowing us to function properly. Now, if you had a computer that had a virus, what you'd probably do with that computer is send it to a professional, or most probably send it back to the factory. Well, that's what recovery is. That's what we're doing. We're taking our operating systems, our minds and hearts, which have come in contact with some faulty information, and sending them back to, you know, the factory. We're sending them to a professional so we can get this all worked out. Now, if my computer had a virus and I gave it to a professional, let's say it was going to take them three days to fix it, I would really miss my computer. Can anyone else identify with that? I mean really miss it. You look at the number of time, I mean the amount of time I spend on the computer or on Facebook or on the internet, it's going to be a tragic three days. Right? And what I might do is use my support system to help me through that, right? I have a great support system, a lot of people who love me. So part of using that support system might just be people empathizing with me. Wow, man, that sucks. Three days, how are you gonna do that? Or maybe a buddy of mine would say, you know what, if you wanna come over to my place and check your email, use my computer, etc." right? So it might be really nice to have that support system to help me through that time. Can we all agree that the support system is not how the computer will get fixed. Is everyone with me on that? No matter how much my friends empathize with my being bummed about not having my computer or even let me use their computers, that won't fix my computer. My computer is going to be fixed because there are actions being taken, in this case by a professional, to fix my computer. So these are two separate things, right? I have this really nice support system that has my back and allows me to feel loved and supported while the actions are being taken to actually take care of this virus, right? No different in recovery, and this creates a really important distinction in terms of the two elements that comprise what we understand as Alcoholics Anonymous. We have a support system, and we have a program of action. The support system is what we call the fellowship. The program of action is what we call the steps, the program, right? The fellowship and the program are not the same thing. It's very important that we understand the difference. The fellowship is the meetings, the coffee, the cookies, the pastries, uh, the stories, the idea of doing a 90 and 90, the idea of calling your sponsor every day, smoking cigarettes with your friends outside, and on and on and on and on. That's all fellowship. It all falls under the umbrella of fellowship. The fellowship is our support system. That's what the fellowship does. It supports us. What does it support us in doing? Program. The book, Alcoholics Anonymous, in the chapter called The Doctor's Opinion, the first chapter in the book, explains to us that if you have this illness called alcoholism, what you're going to need to get better is what Dr. Silkworth explains in that chapter, and we went over this as a complete psychic change. You're not going to have a complete psychic change in the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. That would be like expecting the support of your buddies to make your computer work properly, right? We're gonna to come to the fellowship to get support and love while we have the complete psychic change through the program. 
And the program is in the 12 steps. And the directions on how to do the 12 steps are the, in the first 164 pages of the book called Alcoholics Anonymous. Okay? Very important we understand the difference between them and we understand where the solution lies. Okay? So once you've got that virus off your computer and your computer's working properly again, you might then want to take some steps to create a situation where you won't get a virus again. Right? That might mean getting some uh, protection software, etc. That's sort of what we're going to do in the 10th and 12th step. Now that we've got the improper information, our virus taken care of, right? and we've got recovery, which means we've got sanity again, and our brains and hearts are actually working the way a human brain, being's brain and heart ought to work, we have a 10th, 11th, and 12th step so that we can maintenance our spiritual condition and grow it and grow it, okay? Um, you know, there's two spots in the book where Bill Wilson, uh, our primary author, uses the expression, I was rocketed into a fourth dimension of existence. Um, there is a solution in Bill's story, are the two chapters, right? He uses it twice. I was rocketed into a fourth dimension of existence. The fourth dimension of existence that Bill speaks of is the spiritual dimension, right? Now, if that's the fourth dimension, if the spiritual dimension is the fourth dimension, there must be three others, which there are. The physical dimension, the mental dimension, the emotional dimension, right? Every human being has four dimensions. Now, what's interesting about that is three of those four you will be awakened to simply by being born, simply by coming out of the womb. I mean, unless there's something radically wrong with you, just by being brought into the world, you'll be aware that you have a physical dimension. You'll be aware you have a body. You'll be aware you have a mental dimension. You'll know you have a brain. And you'll be aware you have an emotional dimension and that you'll be aware you have feelings. The interesting thing is that the spiritual dimension, which is just as present in human beings as the other three, is the only one that unless it's offered to you and you awaken to it, it will be as if it doesn't exist. And consequently, you'll then be plugged into only three-fourths of yourself. Does that make sense, everybody? Mm -hmm. Which you'd think would lead a human being to a rather intense state of incompleteness, of feeling like something's missing. If you're an alcoholic or another kind of addict, ask yourself, why did you drink? Did you not have the sense that something was missing? Right? That there was some kind of hole? Pretty much any addict would tell you that. Something's missing. What's missing? You're only plugged into three-fourths of yourself. What's worse, you don't realize that that's what's missing. There's no data to let you know what's missing. Therefore, you know something's missing, and you don't know what it is. And one would think if no one's told you that what's missing is on the inside, you'd probably go looking on the outside, because the things that are on the outside are far more tangible. So when you find something that seems to fill that mysterious hole, whether it be booze or drugs or food or sex or gambling or whatever, it would seem to that addict they have found the answer. And then, of course, it only works so long. So when we become spiritually awakened, which happens as we move from steps nine, step nine into steps 10, 11, and 12, what's happened is we've awakened. We were spiritually asleep. We weren't plugged into that fourth dimension. We've awakened. Now we're plugged into all four dimensions. One would think, if you're plugged into all four dimensions, your desire to go looking for something on the outside to fill a hole that's no longer there lessens considerably. That's why we become spiritually awake. Does that make sense, everyone? Yes. Right? So um, in the maintenance and growth of our spiritual condition in steps 10, 11, and 12, we're going to get five major directives that comprise the act of maintaining and growing our spiritual condition. The first one's going to show up in step 10. Step 10 reads, and if you are interested in following along, we're going to be on page uh, 84, uh, which is where step 10 begins. And step 10 reads, continue to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admit it. Right? We've talked about the idea that each step comes with it, a corresponding principle. Does anyone know what the principle to step 10 is? Perseverance. 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 Principle to step 10 is perseverance. 
right? So in step 10, we're going to continue to take personal inventory. And when we were wrong, promptly admit it. If we're going to continue to take personal inventory, where did we originally take personal inventory? Step four. Step four. Right? So you could very much think of the tenth step as a daily fourth step. Right? You can think of the tenth step as a daily fourth step, a mini fourth step on a daily basis. Okay? And in fact, in terms of 10, 11, and 12 being the maintenance and growth steps, the way it breaks down essentially is step 10 maintenance is 4, 5, 6, and 7. 4, 5, 6, and 7 is where we dealt with ourselves and cleansing ourselves. Step 10 is where we maintenance and grow ourselves, our own behavior. Right? Step 11, maintenance is 1, 2, and 3. Because 1, 2, and 3 is where we opened up a relationship with our higher power. 11 is where we're going to maintenance and grow our relationship with our higher power. Right? And then step 12, maintenance is 8 and 9. 8 and 9 is where we dealt with our fellows. Step 12 is about carrying the message to our fellows and practicing these principles in all our affairs with the world around us. Right? So 10 takes care of 4 through 7. 11 takes care of 1, 2, 3. 12 takes care of 8 and 9. That's how that all connects up. Right. So continue to take personal inventory when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Page 84, second full paragraph on page 84. This thought brings us to step 10. Right. We've talked about this. Where the big book will start a new step, and in the first sentence of that step reference the step before. Right. So the thought that brings us to step 10, in the ninth step promises, which is what we closed with, last week, right, in the Ninth Step Promises, uh, the end of the Ninth Step Promises asks, are these extravagant promises? We don't think they are. We think not. These promises are being fulfilled among us. Now, who's us? Anybody know? People in the fellowship. Not the people in the fellowship, the people who've done the work. Right? And the reason I, I, I hone in on, on this idea and the idea that you may think it's the people in the fellowship, they're not saying these ninth step promises, you know, they say they're not extravagant promises. They're absolutely going to come true for you. Not you, the people who attend AA meetings. You, the people who've done the work in the book as it's laid out with a sponsor. Right? And this is not meant to be shaming or punishing. Right? The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are all kinds of other requirements if you actually want to get well and have the promises come true for you. Right? So when they say, we don't think these are extravagant promises, they're being fulfilled among us, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, mm -hmm. they will always materialize if we work for them. So it's only the people that have worked for them who can expect them to be coming true. Then they say, that thought, now that you've got that, hopefully, brings us to step 10, which suggests we continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes, new mistakes, as we go along. We vigorously commenced, commence is to begin, right? We vigorously, and we don't just commence, we vigorously commence. Right? So there's, there's work to be done here. We vigorously commence uh, this way of living. This way of living is steps 10, 11, and 12. Right? 1, 2, and 3 is where we prepare. 4 through 9 is where we recover. 10, 11, and 12 is where we live. We live in 10, 11, and 12. So we're going to commence this way of living <coughs> as we cleaned up the past. Notice it doesn't say after we cleaned up the past or when we were done cleaning up the past. As we cleaned up the past. Cleaning up the past refers to step 9. Step nine. nine. So what we've just been told is as you're doing your amends, you start 10, 11, and 12. Right? So the idea that you're supposed to do all your ninth step amends before you move to 10, 11, and 12 is unequivocally wrong. As soon as you begin your amends, you're being shuttled right into the maintenance and growth steps of 10, 11, and 12. So essentially, 9, 10, 11, and 12, to some extent, are all working together. Right? We have entered the world of the spirit. There it is. So our spiritual awakening has now taken place. We've entered the world of the spirit. Our next function, right? you remember in the ninth step where we talked about our real purpose? being of maximum service to God and the people about us, they're calling to mind the same thing. Our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. That's what this is all about. This is not an overnight matter. It should continue for our lifetime. So you got your lifetime to live in the steps. You have your lifetime 
to derive the depth of what these steps have to offer. Right. So why not work them quickly and effectively, get to your spiritual awakening, and then you have forever to work out what the steps have to offer you. Right? But it's not until you've spiritually awakened that the crisis is out of the way. When you live in the crisis of addiction on a daily basis, that's about all you can deal with. You're just dealing with the crisis of addiction. The idea is not that you work all the steps and then all your problems are solved. The idea is that you work the steps so that you can start to learn to deal with your problems. If you're not dealing with the crisis of addiction day in and day out, you can actually deal with all the other crap you probably have going on. Right? Because it's the rare alcoholic who comes in here and the only thing wrong with them is the way in which alcohol is affecting their body. There's a few of those and too many. Right? So now we get our 10 step directions. Page 84, second full paragraph, picking up where we left off. Continue to watch for, so here's your 10 step directions. You need to stay on watch for something. Right? What is that something? Four things actually. Selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, fear. Continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, fear. These are the four horsemen. Right? What this means is that any way in which you're being hurtful, um, inappropriate, what have you, any way you're screwing up, as it were, is going to fall into one or more of those categories, selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear, which is another way of saying if you stay on watch for those four things, you'll be on watch for everything. Notice the next four words. When these crop up. When these crop up. Right? It doesn't say if these crop up, or in case these crop up. You've recovered from a hopeless state of mind and body. You've not recovered from being human. So if you've got it in your mind that because you've moved into 10, 11, and 12 and recovered, that you're done being selfish, dishonest, resentful, or fearful, wow. You're going to be set up for probably a rather uncomfortable surprise. When these crop up, they're going to crop up. When they do, here's what you do. Four things. We're going to get a little four-step process, and this is called doing a tenth step, to deal with it when we are being selfish, dishonest, resentful, fearful, or two, three, or four of them. First thing we do is we ask God at once to remove them. We go straight to God, straight to prayer. Right? Hopefully we've been doing our third step declaration and seven step prayer every day, so we should know how to do this by now. We should have some experience talking to God. Right? We go straight to God. Notice it doesn't say we go straight to who? Sponsor. Uh, so our sponsor. Right? It doesn't say go straight to your sponsor. It says you go to God. A good sponsor who knows what they're doing and is not operating on ego, when a sponsee who's gone through the steps calls them with what they perceive to be a problem, really the first proper thing to say is, did you pray? No. <clears throat> okay, pray and call me back. Why? You're trying to be unkind? No. <laughs> the idea is not to be unkind, but I certainly want to let my sponsees know I'm happy to provide you counsel if I have some, based on my own experience, strength, and hope, but I definitely don't have better counsel than God does. And you're directly connected to God now. Your relationship with me was primarily so I could be the conduit to God's love while you cleansed. Now that you've done that, you're directly connected to God. So your first order of business is go to God. The second order of business, we discuss them with someone immediately. So yes, once you've gone to mm -hmm. God, talk to a human being. Don't keep a secret. Maybe your sponsor, maybe someone else in the program, maybe your spouse, maybe your neighbor, whatever's appropriate. But you're going to talk to somebody. Three, make amends quickly if we've harmed anyone. So if the way in which you've been selfish, dishonest, resentful, fearful, hurt somebody, and it may not have, go make an amend. You're doing the ninth step. You should know how to do that by now. Right? And the ninth step amends were not just to clean up your harms from the past. You're not done harming people. You'll probably do it less, but mainly, you now will know what to do when it happens. And then four, we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. Right? We turn our mind to being of use to others. Love and tolerance of others is our code. This is called doing a tenth step. Here's an example. Uh, let's say my wife and I are having a discussion, and we have contrary opinions. 
And that particular discussion on this particular day rises to something of a debate. And the debate starts to veer into something of an argument in that we're both starting to get heated, we're both starting to get louder, <clears throat> and perhaps we find ourselves on the verge of being mean, taking shots at each other, rather than just holding down our side of the debate. Right? <clears throat> it wouldn't be unusual for me to say to my wife, OK, let's, let's put a pin in this for 15 minutes. I'm going to go downstairs, which is where my office is, and just clear my mind. Right? Now, the very first time I said that to her, my memory is that she didn't love it. Perhaps she was feeling abandoned, like I was walking out on this thing we're doing. Right? I eventually was able to explain to her that my motive for doing that, we all know what fight or flight means. You don't know that expression. right? When you're in fight or flight mode, your options have been reduced to two. You're either going to fight or flee. So I'm able, I was able to say to her, listen, when I bail out like that, it's because I've come to a point where I'm hopped up and angry enough that I realize I'm going to start saying things I don't mean or that I might regret later, or I'm going to get out and breathe for a while. And of those two options, the latter one is better. And she really got that. Right? I'm not suggesting my wife wouldn't take this action either. Um, but So I go downstairs. What do I do downstairs? Well, one, I'm going to talk to God. Right? So perhaps I'll, close my, I'll sit on the couch down there and close my eyes and say, God, often out loud, God, I need some help here. I'm full of rage. My heart's beating. I'm angry. Um, I have the instinct to be mean and unkind. I don't think that's what I want to do. But I need your help. Right? And I'll close my eyes for five seconds and just breathe, which will probably give me just enough of uh, um, a soundness of mind to flip my phone open and call my sponsor. Hey, Andrew. Hey, Michael. What's going on? Oh, I'm just in a big fight with Lori. Oh, huh? wow. Well, why don't you go up and put your arms around her and tell you love her? Well, yeah. All right. I, you know what happened? I came home, and and you know she said X, and I said Y, and then and I was like, how could you say Y? And he was like, yeah. Go upstairs, put your arms around her, um, tell you love her. Yeah, Andrew, you're not listening to me. I'm trying to. No, Michael, you're not listening to me. <laughs> Go upstairs, put your arms around her, and tell her you love her. Ask yourself, what are you trying to accomplish in this marriage? What's your goal? Is it to love Lori the best you can, or is it to be right, to win? Right? You want to be right, you want to be happy, because you can't be both. Wow. That's useful. Right? So now that I've talked to God and another human being, I'm actually not angry anymore. Right? And I can go up and put my arms around my wife and say, I love you. Uh, make my amend. Wow, you know what? When you said that, I think I got a little defensive, and I probably shouldn't have said that. That wasn't fair. And I don't think I gave you room to speak when you were trying to explain X. And, and chances are, I've opened up some room for her to do the same. And then we'll finish the conversation, you know, but we'll finish it perhaps not angry. Right? So I've now talked to God. I've talked to another human being. I've made the amends I need to make. And then when I'm done talking to Lori, I'm going to resolutely turn my thoughts to someone I can help. That might be picking up a piece of garbage that isn't mine. It might be putting one of my kids to bed. It might be calling someone who's ill. It might be calling back a sponsee. <laughs> you know, or just being available to do service if service shows up. That's a tense step. Right? So the first spiritual directive we get in terms of maintaining and growing our spiritual condition, doing regular tense steps, not necessarily daily. For many people it is. I've often done them daily over a period of time. Um, 17 years of recovery, I don't think I've ever gone four days without doing a 10 step of some kind, right? And if I have a sponsee who I don't hear from in a month doing a 10 step, I might question, hey, what's going on here? Mainly because if you have gone a month without being selfish, dishonest, resentful, or fearful, <laughs> you probably need to start sponsoring me, All right? So regular 10 steps. That's our first spiritual directive in holding on to and growing what we've been given. Now comes our 10 step promises. So I told you before that what we often hear in the rooms as uh, the promises are actually the ninth step promises. That distinction is important because there are promises throughout the book. Here's our 10 step promises. These are really powerful. 
and we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol, for by this time sanity will have returned. We will seldom be interested in liquor. If tempted, we recoil from it as from a hot flame. We react sanely and normally, and we will find that this has happened automatically. We will see that our new attitude toward liquor has been given us without any thought or effort on our part. It just comes. That's the miracle of it. We're not fighting it. Neither are we avoiding temptation. We feel as though we've been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. We've not even sworn off. Instead, the problem has been removed. It does not exist for us. We are neither cocky nor are we afraid. That is our experience. Here's the caveat. That is how we react so long as we keep in fit spiritual condition. And I've already told you there are five things you need to do on a regular basis to pull off staying in fit spiritual condition. Now, in these 10 step promises, we've just been told that four things have happened, have occurred at this point in the process that have not occurred before now. So four things have now taken place that you cannot expect to have happened previous to entering steps 10, 11, and 12. They are, one, we've ceased fighting. So if you know what it is to live your life on perpetual defense, this is the point at which you can put your dukes down. Right? Two, sanity has returned. This is the point at which the virus has gone from your CPU. You're sane again. Right? Three, you'll, this is the point at which you will feel safe and protected. Does anybody in here know what it is to live a life never really feeling safe in the world? <clears throat> I sure do. This is the point at which that begins to get resolved. And four, perhaps most important, the problem has been removed. Right? So. All this nonsense that goes on in the rooms now that you'll hear in AA throughout the country and probably throughout the world, steps are not a race. There's no rush. Take your time. Work a step a month. Stay in the first step for a year. The thing to understand is using our directions as a guide rather than the opinions of drunks. To tell a newcomer who's just walked in that it's going to take them a year to work these steps, right, is to tell them that it will take them a year to stop fighting. It will take them a year to become sane. It will take them a year to feel safe. It will take them a year before this problem is removed, which means they'll have to sit on their hands for a year. <coughs> if somebody had told me that, I'd be dead. Most of us don't have a year. That's not just erroneous information. That's dangerous information. That's deadly information. It is your responsibility as a member of a 12-step program, as a member of recovery, to understand what it means to properly carry this message. If you don't know how to properly carry this message, for the love of God, keep your mouth shut. And yeah, that's my opinion. That is my opinion. But we also have a lot of history to tell us it's true. That if, if you don't have the right information, we'd prefer you stay in the back and keep your mouth shut rather than continue to spread information that will surely kill people. Okay, so we have our first spiritual directive. Questions about step 10? No? <clears throat> Bill? Is there any time at which, at this point, that someone, a sponsor, will say, go back and do another step, fourth step? go back and do another complete fourth step? Um, not necessarily as a rule or a directive, but certainly it could be offered. Uh, probably not before. Once you're in 10, 11, and 12, and you're living in the solution, um, yeah, I think it would be common at some point to look to re-employ the fourth step if you're finding a fair amount of resentment, fear, and harms are building up. It's a tool we have. So I've probably done three or four formal fourth steps over the years. Uh, probably not right when someone arrives at 10, 11, and 12, but certainly after that, um, if the 10th step is not you know, uh, uh, sufficient in terms of really cleaning up the damage that's building, uh, then yeah, another fourth step would be perfectly reasonable. And what about the people who have been around for a very long time and did many of the things that you said they shouldn't have done? <laughs> uh-huh as far as working the steps, following directions, doing what you're told, and just 
being like a lamb being put to slaughter. Uh -huh. You know, you, I had the feeling that I did a lot of things wrong, but that's what I was directed to do. Uh huh. Well, so in a case like that, yeah. I mean, I mean, part of the the, the main utility of this program of these sessions certainly is for the newcomer. Um, with that said, for someone who's been around for a while and managed to not pick up a drink and accumulate some time, um, uh, but continues to live with a lot of restlessness, irritability, and discontentment, uh, the work not being <coughs> as complete as perhaps it ought to have been could be part of the reason. And going back and doing another fourth step could be a really powerful idea, definitely. So step 11, is now going to give us spiritual directives two, three, and four, right? We're gonna get three directives in the 11th step in terms of maintaining, maintenance and growing our spiritual condition. So step 11 reads, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. It's a lot of words. It's a lot of words and the 11th step, in my mind, is almost its own little direction pamphlet, just in the way it's written, in that it starts with the word sought. So the 11th step is telling us you need to seek something. You need to be out there looking for something. What are we seeking? Before it even tells us what we're seeking, it tells us how we're seeking. So you're going to seek using two very specific tools, the tools of prayer and meditation. Then it tells you what you're seeking using the tools of prayer and meditation. You're seeking to improve your conscious contact with the God of your understanding. And it even tells us that while you're seeking to improve your conscious contact with the God of your understanding using the tools of prayer and meditation, that you ought to be praying really for only two things, knowledge of God's will for us and the power to carry that out. What's your will, God, and how do I best carry out your will? Right, um, which speaks to the idea that, to a large extent, the simpler your prayers, the purer your prayers, and perhaps the more powerful your prayers. Right? Knowledge of God's will for us and the power to carry that out. The idea is that we're not really praying for anything specific. Right? Nobody's saying you're bad or wrong if you pray for something specific. I have found, I try to avoid it. Going back to my wife and family for a moment, because they're, they're pretty much the most powerful place I can go in terms of trying to direct God's will. Okay? Um, I've had the experience of my wife and daughters um, taking a plane somewhere without me a few times. They're going somewhere on a plane, and I'm just I'm not going. right? And so I drive them up to the place where they, they check in. I get out of the car. I give them all hugs and kisses. right? And then uh, Lori, you know, uh, walks out, you know, with both girls. And I, I see them walk into the airport, and I'm in my car, right? And the and the the, the nasty woman in the airport line is like, "Get out of here!" Right? And I'm and I'm watching, and I see Lori and the girls until I can't see them anymore, right? And then as I drive away from the curb, some, I suppose, addict thought in my head pops. That's the last time you're ever going to see them. Does anybody have children or, or even a spouse who can identify with that? Right. That plane's got the last time I'm going to see him. The plane's going to go down. I don't know what that is. But my point here is that in that moment, my instinct is to say, God, please watch over my wife and kids. Please let them have a safe flight. And I resist that. And I resist it because in my experience, I can't wake up every morning and say, thy will be done. God, you run the show. But here's a couple of directives on how to best run Michael's life. <laughs> right? It's not really going to work for me. My goal is to stay out of the way. Do I have any idea how I would live through it if my wife and children went down on a plane? No. No idea. Do I believe that if something like that happened, I could be carried through it by my higher power, that I could stay sober, that I could find a way to perhaps one day be, again, happy, joyous, and free? Yeah, I do. I do. I'm really not interested in being put to that test. 
right? But the thing is, day to day, moment to moment, I don't know what's going to happen. Right? So we want to try to keep our prayers simple and pure as possible. Knowledge of God's will for us, power to carry that out. The book is going to give us some information, some data uh, about how we stay in contact with God and how we work on our conscious contact with God. And the book is going to break it down into three categories. And these are going to be our second, third, and fourth spiritual directives in terms of the maintenance and growth of our spiritual condition. We're going to find out what we do in the mornings. We're going to find out what we do as we go through the day. And we're going to find out what we do in the evening. It's the way it's going to be broken down for us. Interestingly, the book's going to begin with what we do in the evening. You're going to find this on page 86. These are our evening <coughs> prayer directions. Right? Or what, what it's often called um, uh, the maintenance. The maintenance of our daily spiritual condition. Right? So we're going to do a spiritual review in the evening of how we did that day. Of how we were that day. Right? And the book is going to give us 10 questions to ask ourselves each night. The idea being that once you're in 10, 11, and 12, you do this every evening. Right? Nobody's saying if you miss a day, you're bad or wrong or naughty, but this is the idea. Right? So every evening, as a person in recovery, I ask myself the following 10 questions. Question one, where was I resentful today? Who pissed me off today? What resentments am I carrying? Question two, where was I selfish today? Right? And it may be that you weren't selfish today. You don't have to come up with an answer. But, you know, where did you exhibit selfishness today? Three, where was I dishonest today? What lies did I tell? Where was I less than completely honest? Right? And this may involve exaggeration, <coughs> lies of omission, white lies. Right? We have a whole host of, way, uh, of pretty ways to say lie. Four, what was I scared of today? Where did fear show up in my life? Five, do I owe anyone an apology? Is there an amend I need to make? Six, am I keeping anything to myself which I need to discuss with another person? My sponsor, my wife, whoever. Seven, was I kind and loving toward all the people around me? That's pretty much a yes or no question. Eight, what could I have done better? What did I do but not necessarily give my all to? Nine, was I thinking of myself most of the time? It's another yes or no question. Ten, was I thinking of what I could do for others? of what I could pack into the stream of life? It's really another yes or no question. So 10 questions, three of them are pretty much yes or no questions. <clears throat> this is not something that takes a long time. Right? A lot of people call this doing a 10th step in the evening. That's actually a misnomer. It's a part of the 11th step. It doesn't really matter what you call it. Many people will do a written 11th step in the evening. Uh, I'm not giving you that directive specifically, although that can be really powerful to write these things down every night. I've done that, and I've given that suggestion to sponsees. But whether writing it or doing it orally, the idea is every single night you ask yourself these 10 questions to get a sense of, where am I at? How did I do today? It goes on to say we must be careful not to drift into worry, remorse, or morbid reflection, right? Which means this is not an opportunity to beat the shit out of yourself. <laughs> or shame yourself, right? You're not gonna have perfect days. The idea is not to have perfect days. It says, for that would diminish, diminish our usefulness to others. After making our review, we ask God's forgiveness and inquire what corrective measures should be taken. Right, so here would be an example of what I find to be the utility of the nighttime review that I do, right? Let's say it's um, 7.30 in the morning. I get up, uh, it's Tuesday. I have a long line of things I need to do. The first thing I got to do is stop at the bank and put a check into my account, right? So I run over to the bank, I'm on a tight time constraint, I get in line and it's clearly like a new teller who doesn't know what she's doing. And the line is pretty lengthy and by the time I'm next, I'm already three minutes late, right? And then I get up to the front of the line and the woman can't find my account, and she's confused, and she says, you know what, I, I'm going to have to call my manager. And at some point, as all this is going along, I say to her, is there any way we could speed this up? I'm already late. I don't have all day. And then finally, she figures it out, and I leave. Now, on, a, on an average Tuesday, there's probably 175 more things that are going to happen that day before I settle in to do my nighttime prayers. Right? It's very possible that if I don't take some time that evening 
to take a good hard look at my day, I'm going to completely forget what happened at the bank. In fact, by this point, I probably have. But then I settle in quietly, perhaps with my notebook. OK, where was I selfish today? Selfish, selfish, selfish. Let's see. Got up, made the coffee, uh, got gas, went to the bank. Oh, the bank. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I was really kind of a dick to that woman this morning. Hmm. Interesting, right? And at this point, it wouldn't be uncommon for me to go back to that bank the next morning and make an amend, right? If that feels like the appropriate thing to do. But I do realize that what I don't get accountable for, <coughs> I will repeat. It's in many ways the nature of human beings, certainly the nature of addicts, okay? So our second spiritual directive is doing a review of our behavior every evening. Our third spiritual directive is going to show up as we find out what we do in the mornings, every morning. Page 86, second full paragraph. It says, on awakening, let us think about the 24 hours ahead. We consider our plans for the day. Before we begin, we ask God to direct our thinking. Right? Then on 86 in the third full paragraph, it goes on to say, in thinking about our day, we may face indecision. We may not be able to determine which course to take. Here we ask God for inspiration and intuitive thought or a decision. Then on page 87, in the first full paragraph, it reads, we usually conclude the period of meditation, which is what we've been talking about, with a prayer that we be shown all throughout the day what our next step is to be, that we be given whatever we need to take care of such problems. We ask especially for freedom from self-will and are careful to make no requests for ourselves only. What the book is talking about here is starting every day with prayer and meditation. Meditation and prayer. Sir. Yeah. Um, I hear a lot around the tables there are no musts in recovery. Uh-huh. And I'm just going back to the last page on 85. It says must three times in two paragraphs before we hit the 11th step. It actually says must about 75 times in the first 164 pages. And to speak to that in a global way, here's the thing with the musts. Or to, to spin it from the other direction, here's the thing with the whole suggestions piece. right? Because that's what we talk about. It's all suggestions. There can't be musts because they're all suggestions. So if everything's a suggestion in AA, there must be nothing that you must do. right? <laughs> here's where we use the word suggestion improperly. Everything's a suggestion in terms of you coming here. Right? So the price of admission for you to come to AA, be a member of AA, walk in, sit in on the meeting, have a cup of coffee, whatever, everything's a suggestion if that's what you want to do. You want to just come here. It's all suggestion. If you want to recover, if you want to get well, then there are some musts, a lot of them, as a matter of fact. Right? So you need to determine what's your goal. If all you want to do is be able to put your ass down in a seat in Alcoholics Anonymous and not have someone kick you out, the only requirement, the only one, is the desire to stop drinking. And if it's an open meeting, as this is, you don't even need to have that requirement. That's it. Nothing to do. All suggestions. Does that make sense? Right? But if you want to get well, the book is going to tell you again and again and again and again what you must do. Not what they believe you must do, because again, this is not a theoretical book. They're telling you what they've seen and watched. Right? We beg of you to be fearless and thorough. We all know that line? <coughs> They're begging you. We've watched people drop like flies. We're telling you what you're going to have to do if you want to get well. Okay, now, what else? One other thing. Yeah. All these steps leading into the next step, it tells us that we must, or not must, but it says we've got to get on the ball, we've got to keep going, we've got to keep doing more until right. this 11th step, where when we're asking for God's inspiration and intuitive thought, it says we relax and take it easy. That's the only place in the book that I know that I've seen, and it jumped out at me today, mm. where it tells me to relax and take it easy because I'm always trying to push what I'm trying to do, I want to get it done fast enough, and then I want to do what I got to do. But I hear you say it a lot. It always tells us, it never tells us to, to relax and take it easy. But when I'm praying, I 
I think the relax and take it easy for me is more shut up and listen to my meditation instead of so much my prayer. I don't know. Well, and relax and take it easy are actually part of the directions on how to take this action, right? So it's not really the absence of action. You know, the, the directions on how to do the action of the fourth step are make a list. The directions on how to take the action of the 11th step is breathe, take it easy, ask God for direction. So yeah, you're right. Um, and it, you know, what you're talking to also speaks to the old AA adage of easy does it, but do it. <coughs> right? Wear life like a loose garment. Right? The idea is not to run around manic like a chicken with your head cut off. Right? Taking action, being involved in your life, doing the next right thing, does, you know, does not go hand in hand with being manic. Right? We find out we can actually take action and be serene and peaceful. Right there in the Ninth Step Promises. Right, so we're going to find out, and thank you for that, that every morning is to begin with meditation and prayer. Now that may sound complicated. A lot of people, I suppose a lot of people in, in the world, certainly in this country, and for sure in AA, struggle with meditation. So let's be clear about what meditation is. Okay, prayer is the process of asking for God's will. Meditation is the process of listening for the answer. Two-way prayer. That's the idea. Right? So that's not to suggest that if you pray but don't meditate, it's useless. But the utility of it will certainly be lessened. In that if you pray, thy will be done, God's will will be available to you. But if you don't meditate and create some room to have God's will enter you, then you're going to spend a day with God's will available to you and you're just not necessarily feeling it which kind of betrays the point, right? So I'm gonna to wanna to pray for God's will and then meditate and listen for guidance. So, if you don't pray and meditate on a regular basis in the morning and you've come to 10, 11, and 12, and let me be clear, you don't have to be on 10, 11, and 12 to start praying and meditating. I've yet to meet the person who prays and meditates too early or too often or too much or any of that. But if you're on 10, 11, and 12, this becomes an active directive. Prayer and meditation can be as simple as five minutes a morning. Okay, here's, here's my suggestion for a five-minute prayer and meditation commitment for you to do every morning. All right? Not a directive, a suggestion. One way to do it that is fairly user-friendly. Every morning, upon awakening, that means before you take your blankets off. That means before your feet hit the floor, before you enter into your remarkably imperfect human day, connect to your perfect spiritual life. That's the idea, right? Upon awakening, first thing you're gonna do is pray. My recommendation to you is third step declaration, seventh step prayer, 11th step prayer, okay? Third step uh, declaration, page 63 in the big book, Seven Step Prayer, page 76 in the big book. We've been doing those already. The 11 Step Prayer you'll actually find in the book called 12 Steps and 12 Traditions on page 99, uh, but it's also the St. Francis Prayer. So if you have a computer, put St. Francis Prayer into Google, you won't have a hard time finding it. My recommendation is open up a Word document on your computer, cut and paste 3, 7, 11 on one page, print it out, put it on your bedside next to your uh, bed. In the morning, upon awakening, read those three prayers. Two minutes tops to read those three prayers, right? Once you've done that, meditate for three minutes. And I would recommend you time it. Use a radio alarm clock. Time three minutes, right? Set it to some, you know, soft jazz instrumental station low, right? So you don't want to come out of a meditation with like meh, 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 or like heavy metal music or something, right? Something low and mellow enough just so you know when your three minutes is up. Set the timer. As the three minutes begins, uh, make sure your body's comfortable. Breathe normally. Close your eyes. And pay attention to your thoughts. That's it. For the duration of those three minutes, sit in one place. Let your body be comfortable. 
breathe normally, close your eyes, and pay attention to your thoughts. Listen to your mind. No matter what's going on up there, it doesn't matter. Right? If, you can, if you've never meditated before, and you can work it out where you actually have three minutes where all you hear is angels singing, <laughs> awesome. The chances of that are unbelievably minimal, but awesome. Right? Chances are much better. What you'll find over the course of those three minutes is it's kind of loud up there. And there's a lot of different thoughts about a lot of different stuff fighting for attention. Some of them are selfish. Some of them are empathic. <laughs> some of them are scary. It doesn't matter. When the three minutes is up, if you haven't gotten up and left the bed, you've meditated. I promise you, you've meditated. Okay. Every morning, you spend two minutes on those three prayers, three minutes meditating, that's five minutes. You do that every day. Probably by day 15 or 16, although definitely by day 30, you will feel markedly different than you did before you started. That's my promise to you. Okay? Morning prayer and meditation. Now we've got three spiritual directives. Regular 10 steps, spiritual review in the evening before we go to sleep, prayer and meditation in the morning. Now here's the thing about starting your day with prayer and meditation and closing your day uh, with a spiritual review. It's what we call framing our day with prayer. It's awesome, it's powerful, it's fabulous. Although, it's all the hours between those two times of prayer when we're outside amongst the humans, right? Which is where all the challenges tend to happen. So if I find myself really pissed off at 3.30, it's not necessarily gonna be prudent for me to tell myself, well, I'm praying in like four and a half hours, I should be fine, right? I need some help as the day goes along. The book's gonna cover that as well. Page 87, it's gonna go on to 88, but third paragraph on page 87, here's our daily prayer direction. As we go through the day, we pause when agitated or doubtful and ask for the next right thought or action. We constantly remind ourselves, constantly remind ourselves, we are no longer running the show. Humbly saying to ourselves many times each day, many times each day, thy will be done. That is your shorthand 11 step prayer for as you go through the day, right? So if I'm uh, you know, driving on the highway and someone cuts me off and I'm enraged, this is not necessarily going to be a time where I can do a three-minute meditation or ask myself a series of ten questions. Right? This is the point at which perhaps I'll wait till I get to a red light, close my eyes for a second, and just say, that will be done, that will be done, that will be done, that will be done. It's going to remind me to breathe. It's going to remind me to turn it over. It's going to remind me that Michael's self-will doesn't run the show. And we do that multiple times each day, right? That's our fourth spiritual directive, staying in touch with God as the day goes along. If you don't want to use thy will be done, you want to use the serenity prayer, God be with me, I mean, that's your choice, right? But that's how we're going to stay in touch with God as the day goes along, right? It goes on to say, we are then in much less danger of excitement, fear, anger, worry, self-pity, or foolish decisions. We become much more efficient. It's a really powerful word, efficient, efficiency. Right? The thing about a human being is every human being has a limited amount of energy in a given day. You've all had this experience at some point where it's like seven o'clock, you sit down on the couch for a minute and the next thing you know you wake up in your clothes. Right? What is that? That's your body letting you know at seven o'clock, we're done. I don't care if you have more to do. We're done. You're out of energy today. Right? So you have a given amount of energy in a given day. If that's true, then how you utilize that energy, how you disperse that energy, is important. Right? So if I'm using up a whole lot, and think of the serenity prayer now. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. If I'm pouring a bunch of my energy into things I can't change, courage to change the things I can. I may not have the energy I need to change the things I can. That's why the key to that prayer is wisdom to know the difference. God, help me understand what I have power over and what I don't. What deserves my energy and what doesn't. So I can be as efficient as possible today. 
right? Because burning up all your energy worrying about stuff you can't control and then not having the energy you need to deal with the things you can control, that's unmanageability. That's unmanageability. Okay, so we now have four spiritual directives. Regular 10 steps, daily review in the evening, prayer and meditation in the morning, stay in touch with God as the day goes along. Our fifth spiritual tool for the maintenance and growth of our spiritual condition is what the 12th step is all about, which is working with others, working with others, exactly what I'm doing right now. Step 12 also is the only step in the book, the only step of the 12th, that's got an entire chapter devoted to it, right? The entirety of uh, chapter 7 is devoted to working with others. Okay. Um, having had a spiritual awakening, right? Having had, so I've had it already. It happens when I move from 9 into 10, 11, and 12. Having had a spiritual awakening, and that spiritual awakening has been the result of these steps, not the result of sitting in AA rooms, drinking coffee, talking to people, smoking cigarettes, and listening to stories. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we did two things. We tried to carry this message to alcoholics. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm trying to carry this message to alcoholics. Am I being successful? I don't know. It's not really my business. I hope I'm being successful. But to do the 12th step, I need to try to carry the message. And then I'm taking care of me. Whether I'm successful in carrying the message has a lot to do with you, and I can't control you. So we tried to carry this message to alcoholics, and, and now we come back to our real purpose from the ninth step, <coughs> and practice these principles in all our affairs. That's the key to the whole deal. Practice these principles in all our affairs. Okay? Uh, the principle of the twelfth step is service. If I didn't say the principle of the eleventh step is spirituality. So page 89, first line of the chapter. We're going to find out something really important about carrying this message to other alcoholics. Practical experience, not theory, shows that nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking as intensive work with other alcoholics. The number one way for you to guarantee that you never drink again is working with other alcoholics. Right? It's a pretty good motivator. It works when other activities fail. This is our 12th suggestion. Carry this message to other alcoholics, exclamation point. Okay? Not a lot of exclamation points in this book. Not a lot of italics, not a lot of exclamation points. Carry this message to other alcoholics. They're really trying to drive this home. You can help when no one else can. Right? So the number one reason, perhaps, for you to make sure you carry this message to other alcoholics is because it's going to keep you sober. Right? Here's another reason. Next paragraph, 12th step promises. Life will take on new meaning. To watch people recover, to see them help others, to watch loneliness vanish, to see a fellowship grow up about you, to have a host of friends, this is an experience you must not miss. We know that you will not want to miss it. Frequent contact with newcomers and with each other is the bright spot of our lives. And I got to tell you, if somebody had told me the day I walked into AA, the best thing that's going to happen to you in here is that you're going to learn to help other people. Help other people? Who wants to help other people? Help me. Right? I can only tell you, and you'll have to take this as an article of faith, it's the absolute truth. Absolute truth. I never, 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 and let me tell you something. I got an amazing marriage. I have incredible children. I got a lot of reasons to feel really, really good about myself and to feel like the child of God that I am. And they all work in their own way. I never feel closer to the human being I was put on this earth to be than when I do this. Never. It's the best thing there is. We know you will not want to miss it. Don't leave five minutes before the miracle happens. <clears throat> if you haven't been around long enough to get to carry this message to another alcoholic, to get to sponsor another person, to go back to the rehab where you got well and talk to the people in the robes and the slippers. Don't miss out on that. Before you decide to leave, make sure you try that. Right? Now the book is going to start to then tell us how to carry this message properly. Right? 
not just amends, proper amends. We don't just carry this message. We properly carry this message. Page 90, first line on page 90. <clears throat> when you discover a prospect for Alcoholics Anonymous, find out all you can about him. If he does not want to stop drinking, don't waste time trying to persuade him. You may spoil a later opportunity. We don't proselytize. We're not out there trying to convince people they're alcoholic or drag them in here. You don't want to do that. As an example, let's say that you have a brother-in-law and you feel really confident he's got a problem and he could use this place. Right? And you'd like to talk to him. You're willing to break your own anonymity and you'd like to carry a message. You'd like to 12-step him, as we say. Yeah? Here's the way to do that, basically. Ask him if you can talk to him. You're going to do it alone. Let him know the following. I don't know if you know this, but I'm a recovered member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm not saying you're an alcoholic. I can't diagnose you, very important. But I have been concerned about you. This is the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Give it to him. The first 40 pages of the show are here so that a person can diagnose themselves. You might want to take a look at it. And if you ever want to go to a meeting, I will take you. If his answer to you is, yeah, I don't, none of that's really for me, leave him alone and don't mention it again. Ever. You're done now. There are only two things he needs to know. One, help is available. Two, if he wants that help, you'll take him to it. Any other mentioning of it or pushing it you do can only serve to drive him away. Okay? So we want to be cautious. We're not proselytizing. We carry this message by example. This is a pretty popular phrase in AA. Right? Let's say someone does want your help, and you know they want your help because they ask you specifically for your help. Page 91, third paragraph. See your man alone if possible. At first, engage in general conversation. After a while, turn the talk to some phase of drinking. Tell him enough about, listen to this, your drinking habits, symptoms, and experiences to encourage him to speak of himself. If he wishes to talk, let him do so. You will thus get a better idea how you ought to proceed. The idea being, let's say I'm out mowing my lawn and my neighbor comes, you know, walking over across the grass divide, and I turn the lawnmower off, and, and he says, hey, Mike, you go to uh, those AA meetings, don't you? And I say, uh, yeah, Bob, I do. Why do you ask? And he says, well, I don't know if I really need all that, but, you know, lately my drinking has kind of picked up steam, and I've been, like, a little concerned. My wife's kind of upset, and... I don't know, I just thought we could talk a bit, right? What the book just told me is my next line ought not be, so what's going on, Bob? Tell me all about it. Why? Scare him. I'll scare him. And he won't tell me, right? Yeah. It's one thing you can count on with alcoholics. We are liars, <laughs> right? And we play it close to the vest to protect ourselves. So that's not going to get me anywhere. Right? What the book just told us is my next move ought to be something more like, you know what, Bob, I'll finish the loan later. Why don't you come inside, let me put on a pot of coffee, let me tell you a little bit about my experience, what brought me to AA, and you know, you'll see if you identify with any of it. Right? Because if I do that, at some point in telling Bob my story, he's going to identify in. If he's a real alcoholic, he's going to say to himself at some point, oh, we're the same. Then he'll talk to me. Right? Sort of like fishing. Right? If you want to fish, you don't go to the end of a dock and try to beat the fish on the head with a hammer. You won't get anywhere. They'll just take off. Right? You cast the line, you <coughs> sit, and you wait, and you let them come to you. Right? So we need to know how to carry this message, or we're going to accomplish the opposite of what we're trying to accomplish. Right? Let's say now this person actually wants to work with us. Page 94. First full paragraph on 94. Outline the program of action. Right? Will you be my sponsor? Sure. Call me tomorrow. 
That's wrong. It's nice that you said yes, but your job as this person's new sponsor is outline the program of action. Let them know what it is they've just asked you to do, because they may not know. Outline the program of action explaining how you made a self-appraisal, four, five, how you straightened out your past, nine, and why you are now endeavoring to be helpful to him, 12. It is important for him to realize that your attempt to pass this on to him plays a vital part in your recovery. More importantly, he may be helping you more than you're helping him. I'll never forget my first sponsor, Tom, early, early in my recovery, said to me, uh, I got to tell you, Michael, I'm getting more out of this than you are. Right? And I thought to myself, like, wow, is that some happy horseshit they tell newcomers or what? <laughs> right? Then I got my first sponsee, and within a couple of days, I called Tom, oh my God. Right? I, you, totally true. And then I said to that sponsee, I'm getting more out of this than you are. <laughs> it's the nature of the beast. Right? But still true. Um, now they're going to give you some more information about how to work with this person and what you want to keep on watch for. Take a look at page 98. First full paragraph on page 98, you'll, if you'll endure a little bit of counting, fifth line in that paragraph, last word on that line, it says he, and it goes on to the next line, it says he clamors for this or that. Does everyone see that? Mm -hmm. right? He clamors for this or that claiming he cannot master alcohol until his material needs are cared for, right? I haven't had time to do my fourth step because my kids keep me really busy. I can't get to meetings because I'm married and my wife, blah, 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 blah. I have a very important job and whatever. You know, my dog needs to shit four times a day and I have to, whatever they're telling you, nonsense. Nonsense. Some of us have taken very hard knocks to learn this truth. Job or no job, wife or no wife, we simply do not stop drinking so long as we place dependence upon other people ahead of the dependence on God. Listen to this wording. Burn the idea into the consciousness of every man. Right? Not suggest to them. Right? Burn the idea into the consciousness of every man that he can get well regardless of anyone. The only condition is that he trusts in God and clean house. There's an old expression in AA that whatever you put in front of your recovery, you will lose. Right? So the book's real clear about what we need to make clear to our sponsees. We're not talking about being unkind to them, simply being honest with them about mirroring back their priorities and what we're seeing. Right? Um, another misnomer in AA is uh, we hear this got to stay away from people, places, and things stuff. Does everyone understand what I'm talking about yeah. when I say that? Yeah. Right. What's that? Don't take that road that led you here. Right. And it's, it's, a big, it's a big recovery center idea that we must stay away from people, places, and things. Right? Triggers. Right? You may know that word. Let's take a look at page 100. Last paragraph on page 100. Let's see how true this whole people, places, and things stuff is. Assuming we are spiritually fit, which means we've done the steps and we're doing the five things we need to be doing to stay on top of our spiritual recovery and our growth, right? But again, this should happen within a month or so. Assuming we are spiritually fit, we can do all sorts of things alcoholics are not supposed to do. People have said we must not go where liquor is served. We must not have it in our house. We must shun friends who drink. We must avoid moving pictures, they date themselves here a little bit, uh, which show drinking scenes. We must not go into bars. Our friends must hide their bottles if we go to their houses. We mustn't think or be reminded about alcohol at all. Our experience shows that this is not necessarily so. Listen close to this. We meet these conditions every day. An alcoholic who cannot meet them still has an alcoholic mind. There is something the matter with his spiritual status. That tells us you don't need to stay away from people, places, and things. You don't need to stay away from anything. Work your program and go live in the world. I go to bars all the time. I mean, I don't go to bars to, um, 
to hang out and drink seltzer with the drunks. Um, but I don't do that because I couldn't. I do it because it smells like piss, and drunks are no fun to hang out with when they're drunk. So that's just, I'm not interested in that. But I go to bars to see music. I go to bars for all kinds of reasons. If I'm in a bar and I find myself salivating, watching beer steins get filled, I'm not going to tell myself there's something wrong with the bar or that I came to the bar. There's something wrong with me. What am I not doing? Right? Am I praying? Am I not doing 10 steps? Am I doing my spiritual review every evening? Am I staying in touch with God? Am I carrying the message? More often than not, it's going to be pretty clear to me that I'm not doing one of those things. Okay? Very important. Finally, take a look at page 162. <clears throat> and this is the final page in our first 162 pages, which is where the program is. Look at the second full paragraph. In the opinion of this drunk, this is the best conclusion to a book ever. Right? Our co-founders and our pioneers tell us, our book, it's our book. Our. Us and them. They wrote it for us, but it belongs to all of us. Our book is meant to be suggestive only. This comes back to what we were talking about before. Right? No one's saying if you want to hang out in AA, you've got to work these steps. We realize we know only a little High watermark of sobriety when the big book was written was five years. Okay? God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. Ask him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man who is still sick. The answers will come if your own house is in order. But obviously you cannot transmit something you haven't got. So don't go around trying to give recovery to people if you don't have it. See to it that your relationship with him is right, and great events will come to pass for you and count with others. This is the great fact for us. Fact. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Steps 3 and 11. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Steps 4 and 5. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Steps 8 and 9. Give freely of what you find. Step 12. And join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. As you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. It's an honor and a privilege to carry this message. To offer to you what the book offered to me, which is recovery. It's there. It's available. It's not meant to take a long time. And it's meant to be incredibly simple. Not easy. Not the same word. Nothing about getting sober that's easy. But it's almost ridiculously simple. Don't complicate it. Thanks for letting me share with you. We have a nice way to close. Mm -hmm.